Welcome to Live with the Author. I'm Amanda Goodwin, and I'm one of the editors of Reading Research Quarterly. And I have here with me today a special issue of Live with the Author with two of our authors on the special issue for the science of reading. Welcome. We have Sarah Wolf in here and Rachel Gabriel. Welcome. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. So I always start these interviews out with a curiosity. How did you get into this topic? So to be frank, I first got into this topic uh, um, and first started really thinking about the structures of reading instruction um, when I was serving as a reading first reading coach beginning around um, 2003. Um, and during that time, it just raised so many questions about what was the research behind um, the instructional materials that were being used and that were um, embedded in the PD. Um, and that then encouraged me to study um, policy design and policy implementation related to um, reading instruction. Um, and my research has moved in several directions, um, but um, I really care very deeply about um, how and why we are implementing different reading programs and how we're supporting um, teachers and leaders and school systems in implementing these programs. Yeah, and you and I talked a little bit before this interview, but that was what grabbed my attention when I was reading your paper. I'm excited about this implementation piece. And Rachel, how about you? How did you come to this work? Um, similarly, I was a reading teacher and a reading, uh, reading coach for uh, a while, uh, a while back. Um, and one of the things that I've always been interested in is sort of known now as the sociology of science. So what counts as science and how science is constructed and how we understand um, what is scientific and what is expert and who has authority and who doesn't. And so I've been interested in those issues across my work. Uh, and the science of reading really um, pokes at them, really asks us to question um, what counts as evidence and what counts as science and who gets to decide. So this has been a topic I've been following with great interest as it's kind of woven its way across conversations in the media and in um, schools and among parent groups. Uh, and even in um, le legislative hearings and stuff, people really trying to grapple with like, what, what is this science that we're talking about and uh, who decides and who calls it that and what does it include? Um, and Sarah and I are sort of flips of each other. She's, a, a, if, if you'll forgive the reduction, the, the reduction, a leadership person who um, is interested in reading and I am a reading person who's interested in leadership and we've both been focused a lot on implementation and how a policy is written, but then has its own life, another life, um, as people are living it out. So, uh, so it was a natural fit for us to be interested in this topic and to use an implementation uh, lens on it. Well, what a fascinating partnership. I'm so excited about that. And you just provide the perfect segue for my next question, because the science of reading is interpreted in lots of different ways. So what is the science of reading to you guys? Well, I've written a lot about this recently, and so I'm going to, I'll be really fast and, and, and direct people to read ILA Today, which is open access and freely available for my take on this. Okay. But I think at, at the moment, it's just a label um, that is being used to cover lots of different things. And so it should trigger um, the question, what do you mean by that? Uh, at the moment, it's not uh, stable enough for it to signify anything other than an invitation for people to ask more. So, you're, so yours is like a critical perspective on like it's something, but it's really this question of like what really it is. Yeah, and also people using it to cover really different things. So, you know, who, ask whoever said it to you or ask whoever wrote it uh, what, what they mean by it because it could vary pretty significantly. Cool. Sarah, do you have anything to add there? Or? The one, um, the one concrete thing that I would like to add that I think is really important across the domain of reading is that the science of reading is more needs to be and should be and is more inclusive than just the science of phonics instruction. Um, and so pushing again to remember kind of the, you know, the woven strands of all the components of reading instruction and how those work together for students to learn and how they fit together again in sort of in teachers classroom practice. I love it. And that fits a teacher's classroom practice kind of brings me to my next question. How does your article add to this science of reading? I think that the one of the big things or one big takeaway from our piece um, is that 
we need, it's important to not think of sort of the science of reading at an individualistic level or what people know, um, but to really think about what are the systems and structures and broader conditions that enable people to put in place that knowledge and that enab enable people to enact um, the practices aligned with the science and with the knowledge and with the evidence base about what works in reading. Um, and so I think it's a big reminder um, that uh, some of the, the flaws and the issues that we're seeing both in reading practice and in students' reading outcomes, it's not a matter of people not necessarily knowing enough, it's that they are not necessarily positioned within a context where they can do their best work and do um, the types of activities that they um, know about and perhaps would really like to do. That's such a wonderful point. So what do we tell teachers or how do we put people in these positions where they can know, they can do what they know they should be doing and want to be doing? I think there's uh, a few ways to think about the infrastructure that allows teachers to do their best work and allows them to put what they know into practice. Um, but the, the main thing is to not uh, assume that because you don't see a particular approach that it's not uh, intended. Um, there is often a mismatch between a stated policy, we, in our school we will do X, and what actually happens. And there's also often a mismatch between what a teacher uh, knows and wants to do and what actually comes out because those intentions are filtered through the expectations of those around them, the resources that they have, the schedule that they have, the professional development that has been provided and the um, uh, the I'm going to come back to expectations because they're these are sort of layered this the the stated expectations of like what you what what is written or what is said that teachers should be doing and then those unstated expectations which sometimes turn into kind of shadow policies or rumors that teachers believe that they need to be doing or not doing certain things and I think it's really important to think about the um, the infrastructure that surrounds any science of reading, because most of the um, nasty part of the public debate is focused on individuals and makes the assumption that it's a teacher knowing or not knowing that makes the difference between whether students are taught using scientific methods or not. And we really want to shift the focus off the individual teacher. Um, they are part, they should be like in the edge of the spotlight, they are part of what happens, um, but they are working within systems that set and limit what they are allowed to do um, in implicit and explicit ways, and also set and limit what they are allowed to use in order to do it. And so the materials as well, um, and the time of day, and the number of kids in the classroom, all of those are things that are interacting with a teacher's knowledge. I think that's so important. You know, I always think about these big principles. And I think about walking into a room. Um, I once taught 24 first graders um, in a room. And teaching 24 first graders was really different than teaching 18 first graders. You know, so there's all these different things to think about. And, you know, so what is this changing this perspective? You know, moving from the individual teacher to thinking about the larger context. Uh, mean for our principals and policymakers who often are in charge of forming these larger contexts? Um, so we included leadership as one of the pillars um, and one of the sort of infrastructural elements that, that really matter um, if we want reading improvement to happen. Um, but we have two other pillars, curriculum and professional development. And so I think one, um, one important piece, sort of when taking the systemic approach, um, is for leaders to be really, um, really thoughtful and really um, analytic in terms of how they are designing and selecting and implementing either curriculum or professional development. Um, and this means really sort of doing their homework and, and looking through what are the messages baked into this curriculum. The curriculum might have a label that says scientifically based or common core aligned, but what happens when you really open it up? What, and same with the PD. The PD uh, vendor may say, you know, this is scientifically based, but does it really work for, how effective is it going to be for our fifth grade teachers if the focus is, you know, much more targeted to K2 or something like that? So I think it's really important for um, both district and school leaders to be really conscientious um, as they're doing this sort of selection of curricular materials in reading, um, as well as professional development, and really thinking carefully about how is it going to fit with their context? What other resources might be necessary to tailor it to their context? 
um, to ensure that it can actually um, be effective and um, motivate the teachers and the leaders um, within that setting. Well, and one thing I loved when I was reading your paper, I feel like this, there's this point where leaders need to be reflective about the curriculum. Um, and so they need to dig in and figure out, you know, not just the labels of it, but what's actually in it. But you also made this point that they should collect and analyze evidence on educators' experiences with and responses to that curriculum. Can you talk to a little bit about how um, leaders might need to move beyond just like me as a principal, I'm gonna study that curriculum versus thinking more broadly at sort of the intersection of these pillars? I think that has um, a lot to do with coherence, which is another big theme in our um, in our paper. Um, partly, uh, the you know it might be a great curriculum, and even when you in, you open it up and dig into it, you might be finding messages that you think as a leader do align with the science of reading or do align with evidence. Um, but it's sending messages that maybe don't align with some of the messages about teaching and learning that appear in the social studies curriculum or in the math curriculum. Um, or it may be that most of your PD has been focused on a certain version of the learner in terms of social emotional learning um, and the learners really describe differently in the um, reading materials. They both may be right, they both may be valid, but you're, uh, you're asking teachers to deal with competing messages and competing versions of what counts as good teaching and what counts as um, the ideal learner and what they can expect from the learner. So in as much as any curricular material sort of sets and limits what counts as good in a classroom, um, we're looking for messages that don't compete with each other so that teachers aren't having to um, play traffic cop with all of these conflicting messages from different areas. And that also is true over time. So I think that's what you're alluding to in the question framing itself. Um, if teachers uh, are very comfortable with a particular approach and you are changing the approach, they may have preconceived notions about that approach. They may have experience having used it in the district before you got there and know what happened with it and why it was abandoned. And they may be bringing their experience with that and their professional, their professional historical knowledge um, to the curriculum. Now, that could be for good. That could be great news that somebody already knows uh, the ins and outs of that uh, set of tools. But it also means that some folks are going to be uh, transitioning and that transition needs to be managed and directed and led. Um, especially if, if what they're transitioning from is pretty far, either far away, either in terms of materials or philosophy or structure. If it's a big leap, it needs more support. Um, and then also folks, um, as we were talking about before, this early literacy is a contentious issue and people have pretty strong opinions about what it should and shouldn't look like. Some of those opinions, most of those opinions are tied to particular kind of buzzwords and labels and brand names. And sometimes without even knowing what's inside of those labels and brand names, um, people have preconceived notions about what is bad and they are not going to do it because they just think it's part of the other side and the wrong stuff and what is good and they think it's going to be wonderful and they will do it without being particularly critical of it. And so you may be introducing a curriculum to people who think that it's bad and don't want anything to do with it and are going to do their best to resist or are going to kind of do it half-heartedly but they're going to be mixing in other things as they go and it may create incoherence for the student. So you want to know how that curriculum is hitting the folks that you are handing it to based on their past experiences, their uh, beliefs and, and perspective, and then also just based on the historical experience of the district and what, what other messages have been sent or are being sent in their other work. I feel like all that is so important. It's feel, oh, do you want to add to that, Sarah? If, if I could add briefly, I mean, I think um, I really appreciated how Rachel um, brought up, she brought, she brought up something that I really appreciated, um, that, um, that she was bringing up this idea of collecting um, kind of process data and evidence on, on practice data and how are teachers experiencing and how are they sort of carrying out um, the program kind of on the ground within their classrooms. I think that within the accountability policy era, we've done a lot of measurement of sort of inputs and outputs and outputs oftentimes being student achievement and sometimes outputs being certain things within noticing certain things within teachers classrooms, such as using uh, teacher evaluation rubrics. Um, but we're not necessarily paying attention to those mediating steps and the sort of 
what are those intermediate steps, you know, halfway through the year when teachers are using a new curriculum? How comfortable are they with it? How are they, you know, how are they able to squeeze in all the aspects of the curriculum into their scheduled reading block? Things like that. Um, and so I think it's important for leaders to get a sense of that sort of process level on the ground implementation data from their sites. And that data is really important for continuous improvement. So I think we're trying to make this link that there needs to be sort of continuous improvement while enacting the science of reading. And it's not something that you um, adopt and say, you know, kind of like the stamp on the textbook, now we're doing science of reading, you're always going to be refining it and continuously improve, improving it. And so thinking of that continuous improvement cycle and collecting process and practice data will help leaders um, do that really hard, challenging, layered work um, to not just sort of have the approved curriculum or all teachers attend a particular PD, but instead sort of refine and revise their practice um, iteratively over time. Yeah, and so it um, makes me sort of think of the three, three. I take it like kind of three big takeaways from this discussion. One is your pillars alone. So like curriculum, PD, and leadership matters. And then I'm also hearing that like a big role of leadership is to be really strategic in their choice of curriculum and PD. And part of that is like analyzing it carefully myself, but then also really thinking about um, its implementation and how it relates to my context, my teachers, the perspective. But then I'm also hearing a third thing, which is like study the process itself, study the implementation and how teachers are reacting to it. And this is not just an, you are gonna adopt it once, but you're going to continue to refine across time. Right on. Yeah. All right. Love it when it's right on. So I always think when I'm reading these things as a teacher, because I was a teacher for so for me, many years, and I wonder what can teachers do? Because it seems like your work has a lot of implementations for leadership, but what can teachers do using the messages of your study? I have a, uh, a quick thing. Um, I, I highly recommend that teachers ask lots of questions. So ask lots of questions about the curriculum. Ask lots of questions during, before, during, and after a professional development. Um, and the asking questions might be of other teachers that are within their grade level teams that they're building. The questions might go to their principals or their coaches or even district leaders. The questions could also go to folks in their broader professional networks, asking questions of people that they engage with on Twitter, asking questions of um, other friends, colleagues, folks in their network um, from their educator preparation programs. Um, I think it's um, important to have that sort of um, social and situated and networked continual learning about reading curriculum, about reading professional development offerings, and about leadership. Um, so asking others, what, what does your principal do for reading instruction? How is, your, how is your principal observing or giving you feedback on your online reading mini lessons that you are now doing in the COVID era? Um, how are your district leaders, when do you get your leveled library sets from, you know, in your district? Um, things like that. And that seems important. And the other thing I'm kind of like inferring from listening to you guys is that also as a teacher, maybe I kind of try not to react so strongly. You were talking about buzzwords and you were talking about how we all come from different traditions and we like to do what we do. Um, and so when somebody like says, we're gonna take a new curriculum, um, you know, I know I used to be like, oh, a new one again. Um, so I'm also hearing from you that maybe there's a reason for it and maybe ask those questions to understand what is the reason for the new curriculum and how does the new curriculum similar or different from what we did and how does it represent the science of reading in strong ways and my context in strong ways? Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of your work is building your own coherence. Nobody can do that for you. So um, what Sarah was saying about making sure that you don't do this work alone, that orienting yourself to the new curriculum or, or, or reorienting yourself to the one that's already there and understanding the ways that it is and isn't used scientifically, um, you can't do that alone. Uh, but also, it, 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 it is a process that, that um, your ability to use a curriculum isn't like turning on a light switch. It takes time to get to know it and not just logistically, like where is the teacher manual for this part, um, but also how does this work with my students and how does it layer into my understanding of things and that 
uh, the same way that we want leaders to think about it as a process that is aimed at continually improving. Um, we really want to think about ourselves as educators, as learners of curriculum and of our students. And so we, you know, not being hard on yourself in the very beginning when things aren't going super smoothly and also not rejecting the whole curriculum when it doesn't go smoothly. Thinking about um, development over time and change over time. Making sure that you leave room for that for yourself, just like you leave room for that with other people. And that's why you need your colleagues and that's why you need leadership that leaves room for development um, instead of um, asking for fidelity tomorrow as if that is the end goal. That's so important. And just your comment on like kind of be, having grace and, you know, if it doesn't work out at first and trying something new makes me think about my role as a parent. So what does your study mean as for us parents out there? What can we take away from it? Sarah's been a parent longer, so she can go first. <laughs> well, I think one thing that we hinted at at the end, I think we could have said more within the article, but I, I think that we have we have ideas on this is I think is um, in our piece, because we are taking a system level approach, we're kind of, we're opening up the envelope and sort of reminding and, and inviting parents to, to think carefully about how do we support and um, provide resources for public schools? Um, and how do we ensure if we want to systemically improve reading instruction, um, which we know is a huge gateway to support students' development and to promote a variety of long-term positive outcomes for, um, for youth, um, it's critically important that schools have, um, that schools are well-funded. Um, and right now there's some very large inequities in how schools are funded um, from town to town, from state to state, from region to region. Um, sometimes schools, you know, two miles apart from each other uh, look entirely different and have totally different um, sets of constraints uh, regarding you know, purchasing curricula, hiring teachers, um, and the like. COVID times, it seems like it's exasperated right now. Yes, yes, yes. And, and COVID is pulling back the curtain on the on these inequities. And, and so I think that our piece is sort of inviting parents and urging parents to think through how do we fund and resource and support our public schools so that they can do this continual iterative work to improve reading instruction and, and literacy outcomes. And that that has to be coherent over time. So, um, so thinking about not just sort of like, uh, I'm going to donate a book to this one classroom that, um, you know, but thinking about uh, the system and how it, how it works. I think COVID is, has uh, shown me as a parent how much infrastructure matters to the kind of education that my students are getting because, you know, in a lot of ways, like uh, the names and faces are the same, the teachers and the leaders are the same in the schools that my, uh, child, my child attends, but the infrastructure is totally different. Now it's happening online at a different time on a different, in a different room in a different, like all of the, so those infrastructural elements um, are shifting. And I think I spent as a researcher a long time, um, you know, being brought, brought up as a researcher in the era where we were talking all about how the teacher is the single greatest school-based factor in terms of student achievement and right now i'm i'm really drawn to everything else so it's almost like a figure ground problem here that like i spent a lot of time thinking about you know it's not about school quality it's about teacher quality well at the moment um we are seeing how much infrastructure really matters and matters to our lives when does school start when what kind of homework do the kids bring home like that those pieces um uh, are in sharper relief. And so I guess the parent takeaway number one is that it does take a village that the same way that you want a good relationship with your teacher, you do also want a, a good relationship with those around the teacher, um, right. the other middle level and upper level administrators and supporting their work and in terms of supporting their work and being aware of their work because it makes a big difference. Uh, what they are thinking and doing makes a big difference for what the teachers can do. And yeah, no, it's, it's funny you say that I this morning I was complaining about my daughter's curricula, you know what she brought home and as we we're talking here I was like I shouldn't complain to her. I should go co like not complain, but I should go like get a better understanding of what the direct like the what the literacy um, coach is thinking, you know what the larger structures are in that environment. So. Right. Where did this decision come from and what does it have to do with exactly because you know and it, because we could invite the teacher to do something slightly different. Um, but that just increases the incoherence and separates her from a system that could be supporting her. It, it might also not increase the equity too. 
Right, exactly, exactly. Different things. So this sort of makes me think about research. What do we, we as researchers need to do as we're moving forward, given your findings? Oh, we just can't forget about leadership when we're thinking about instruction. Done. <laughs> I think we also need to compare um, the implementation of reading curriculum and reading PD in different contexts, in different types of systems, whether it's across states, whether it's comparing small districts versus large districts. Um, I think we, we have much to learn about how the system level conditions um, and how these, you know, how are state and district leaders planning professional development? Are they planning, do they have a three-year PD plan or do they, are they planning for the PD that's literally three days away? Um, I, I think we need to understand more about that to figure out how and why or how to sort of improve these, these structures and, and improve these elements of the infrastructure. Totally. And it seems like we study a lot about like individual curricula or individual interventions, but the question is more, how do they come together? You know, you mentioned is coherence and you mentioned whether it's coherent with social studies and science. Like, I don't think we're doing a great job as a field thinking about that coherence question. And so hopefully yeah. you can really think yeah. about that translation piece, that context piece, that coherence. Um, when we're and with the Sorry to interrupt there. That's especially important in terms of the coherence between the programs or the approaches used in intervention and instruction. That and special education and general education. We're asking kids to make sense of gaps in thinking and curriculum that teachers can't make sense of because they don't make sense. So, <laughs> so it is really important to think about how these things fit with others because it may be that an intervention is super successful, but only in particular contexts. And the other fit piece that I want to add is I think that there's, um, there's room for us to learn about when is it too much. So um, we hint at sort of the too much of some of the, the number of changes that we're asking schools to make and the number of things we're asking schools to do. And I think we're noticing some of this within the COVID era again. So schools are providing free lunch, dental screenings, reading instruction, math instruction, intervention, occupational therapy, speech therapy, vision testing. Like there's a certain point, obviously we, we need to continue to do those things, but how do we have infrastructure to do all of that? And when do certain, um, how and why can other um, fields or domains sort of support some of that? Um, and how do we make it coherent? Um, it just seems like that emphasis on infrastructure seems so, so important. And so I've loved this conversation. I, like I said, I mean, it's literally changed how my day-to-day -day goes as well as my big picture um, understanding of education. And so as we leave this conversation, are there any big picture ideas or main points that you want us to take away? I'm going to stare at Sarah until she answers. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amanda, you've done such a beautiful job of kind of highlighting and summarizing our big, our, our main points. And I think it, when in designing the article, we um, planned uh, sort of, we tried to be architectural about it in terms of the idea of the pillars um, and using that language intentionally uh, and trying to make sure that those pillars of curriculum, PD and leadership are kind of a clear framework for how we'd like for people to be thinking about not just change in curriculum, but the implementation of existing curriculum. And that even if you are not adopting a new one this year or haven't for a long time, that those pillars are still what set and limit what's possible with any given curriculum. And so as we're thinking about the science of reading and debates about the science of reading, we really want to shift the focus away from what an individual teacher knows and more toward what teachers are able to do in context. Um, and that's true not only when we're thinking about their preparation, but also when we're thinking about the support and the infrastructure that they work in uh, over time. Fascinating. So again, if you want to read more about this, you can find um, Sarah Wolfen and Rachel Gabriel's paper entitled Building Infrastructure for Improving Reading Instruction in our first special issue on the science of reading. Thank you guys both so much. As always, totally fascinating. And I'm looking forward to seeing how these ideas are put in practice. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thank you so much. Take care.